Namaste everyone. Welcome Namaste. to today's guest talk. The topic we are discussing today is compassionate coexistence. And we have a guest speaker with today, uh, with us today, uh, Aparajita Amita Matthew. I would like to share a brief introduction for her. Social Anthropologist from the School of Indians and African Studies, University of London. Aparajita is working in the development sector in India over the past three years. She is committed to working for a more just and humane society where she helps to better connect people, animals, and all creatures on the planet. She has been actively involved in volunteering teaching children, children and advocating compassion towards every species on earth, especially nature conservation and preventing cruelty towards animals. We welcome you, Aprajita. Thank you so much for joining the Yes Talk today and uh, looking forward to an enlightening session with you. Over to you, please. Thank you, Arunima. Thank you, Dr. Bajlani, sir, to invite me for the talk. Thank you, and thank you, everyone else. And good evening to all. Um, so in today's session, I will be speaking about how compassion blooms through different stories that I have experienced through my short span in life um, for the last 26 years. And secondly, explore the blockages that are stopping us from attaining compassion within the self and towards others. Understanding how culture, religion, and ha that have been playing a key role in understanding what compassion really is in our everyday life. Then I would also be sharing tips and ways each one of you could practice compassion in your life, within yourself, and towards others. I'll be sharing my screen. There's a short uh, presentation I have prepared. And uh, as we move forward, um, when you see all these lovely beings, how do you feel? Is it something positive that is invoking within yourself? Does it remind you of a time or someone that was close to you and was a part of your life in your journey? Or does it feel that there was something missing and you've got it back or remembered? Do share a few of your thoughts in the chat and let me know. Now that we move to the next slide, how do you feel when you see these words, spider, house gecko, snake, cockroach, termite, and others? These are some things that we think, you know, is dirty, is separate. It's not something that's what we call cute, beautiful, but something that we feel a little disgusted about. The entire talk today I'm gonna do as mentioned earlier by Arunema, is compassionate coexistence. In a planet where we live and coexist with so many other people and also other beings, it is important for us to know that in each part of our life, life itself is possible only because each and every creature is on earth. From the spider to a horse, to a cockroach, to a termite, did you know that termites are also called the air conditioners of the earth? Without termites, our earth's ecosystem, or should I say the underground ecosystem would not be as it is uh, vibrant and also accommodative to other beings. So we should take a pride and understand each of these wonderful creatures. For example, spiders, have you seen how hardworking they are? Each time we take our little finger and destroy their web, they come back and rebuild the entire web again. And with the same amount of hard work and beauty that they did previously. A slithery little snake. Yes, I do understand culturally we have a lot of notions against the snake, but snakes also, as you should know, are actually 
the, um, beings that capture rodents, protect our crops, and also again, we coexist next to them. Now, we I would just talk about what compassion is to me before I go to what other theories and other uh, cultural norms are telling about. For me, what I've realized through the years is that compassion begins from within yourself and also the environment as you come in touch with them. Uh, from the moment you're born to the moment you die, you are within yourself and to the nature connected to one another. When you're connected to one another, you come in contact with both positives and negative thoughts. These thoughts and conditions tell you, okay, this is something that I find very sweet or very beautiful or something that invokes again happiness. But there's some other things that you might feel, oh, it's so dirty, it's so bad, dur rakho in mutse. But only when we start understanding what are the causes that we feel that something is pretty and something is not so pretty is because we call something as blockages. So as I mentioned earlier in the talk, I will be talking about blockages, culture philosophy, and future path. I'll be stopping at blockages before I um, um, uh, move on to what are the cultures and philosophy. And I shall stop the screen here so that we can see each other while I talk. Um, sharing a few experiences that I had um, in my life before we go to blockages, because in these instances that I will share with you right now, you would understand what are the small and tiny acts of compassion that we as human beings have provided to one another, to ourselves and to other beings and within each, the conversation between each of the beings. Here, the kind of points you kind of capture will later tell you what are the blockages and what are the factors that play an important role to your way of compassion. When I go down my memory lane, the first act of compassion or love, as I say, that I had was for my first dog, Naughty. And Naughty came to our life very accidentally. She was just one of the strays outside our house. We started feeding it. And slowly and slowly, we realized our bond with her kind of deepened. And she started coming inside. And she became a part of our family, along with the other pack, but she was one of the females that I could relate to. She was also pregnant at that time. She was expecting her pups. And it was really a, a time when I realized that how much we understand each of what I used to understand about what dogs are. Are they just pets? Are they just companions to keep us happy just because we are being stressed out and uh, we want to get something that might uh, distract us? No, this was for me a sister that our planet Earth gave to me. And she was the moment where I realized that my love was deeper and I could actually be with them and also learn from them. And after her continuous, we had about uh, eight to 10 pets in the last one, uh, one and a half decades. And we have small stories that kind of bloom my own love for both me, my family and others. We had Cookie. She was a dwarf um, dog that we had, again, a rescue. We've never bought a dog. For us, adoption is the right way to do, and it is good to give life to a person who needs it. And Cookie was a time when we found that not only us kids have fun in life, it's also each human being. And the idea of living at the moment understanding, oh, this is the food I get today. Wow. I don't care how much I get. This is the food I got and I should be thankful to it. The moment you enter the park, before you enter the park, she would be all nice and uh, nice dog, uh, little puppy who will be running beside you. But as soon as you enter the park, her ears are up. She's full of joy. She can run like a horse and measure the entire park. And it used to be a fun moment. Each of these moments that we had with these beings taught us something very important in life as we grow up. And these things could be from both accepting your change that is constant, second, enjoying your moment. And the third, as we move on, is, uh, is a story of two dogs that we had. 
One is Tilak and the other one is Greedy, aka also called Molly by the office people who used to feed her. So Tilak came to us as a lost puppy and we didn't know what to do of it. We didn't know, we didn't have place at home. We did not know who to give. No, uh, we were finding it difficult to get anyone to adopt him. And my other dog, Greedy, who was there at that moment, decided, now nah, this is one time I can bully a little puppy. And for her, it was the first time seeing a puppy experimenting, what is this tiny being? And it was a little, Tom and Jerry kind of a situation at home. And then we decided, okay, we have space at my dad's office. Why not send it there and it'll grow up as a guard dog. And to our astonishment, when the dog went there, he was a big hit amongst the ladies of the office. And also he was a very good dog because he used to alert the security guards if there was anything um, uh, risky that was happening or any unknown person was coming. So he became a good companion, not only to us as a family, but also as others in the office. He was a good colleague, uh, as my dad says. And Greedy, um, who was at that time, who used to stay with us, she too, uh, we realized as she was growing old, she needed a lot of care. And because we are traveling, we didn't know what to do. And again, she followed Tilak. She went to the office. And when she went to the office, she lived amazing, uh, what should I say, an old age. And this is a blessed old age, I say, for a dog. When they get your khana pina, your shelter, your companionship, and also being resurrected, as I say, uh, keeps telling my friends that Greedy resurrected thrice from the dead because each time she there was a hit or run case, there was someone who was bullying it or she had illness. It was the kind hearted people who were there at that moment um, near her who actually took her and got her medical care and brought her back to life. And this is something I'm really thankful for because at this moment, by till this moment, I used to think, oh no, animals are doing much more than humans. And these small act of kindness, I don't know how much it means to everyone else, but for me, it was a big thing because just that one act of kindness of taking someone else's dog and going to the hospital and treating it as its own, I realized that that was compassion in a different form, but something that we all could take in ourselves. As we move further, uh, closer to my home um, in South Delhi, there's a neighbor we have who's called Rekha. Rekha auntie is someone who I would say is a mother of over 50 animals. She feeds them every day without fail at that particular time. And the beauty is that all the animals in the colony come to their feeding spots because they know that this lady, this loving human will without fail bring them something to eat and that day they'll go without hunger. And this hope that they have, this is something that we don't imbibe in ourselves, this small hope that something good will happen every day. Tell me one thing, has it ever been to all of you that there was a day when you're looking forward to something, but there's nothing bright happening? Everything bad is happening one by one by one and you're losing hope. But then there's some one act of kindness, even someone saying thank you or giving you a hug that day just makes your day. This is something that the dogs and the cats in the colony, they feel for us humans. They are not bothered about isne isse kiya, nothing as such. At the end of the day, the hope is you are being loved and someone is out there to love you. Moving on, um, when I was in college, or should I say, yeah, in between college, I went to the Madras Crocodile Bank. The reason I went there was, is my love or what I call compassion only to kutta billi, as we say? Or is it more than that? Is it to all beings? And to put my fear to the challenge, and I must confess, I am a little afraid of the house gecko. Um, so I needed to know if I truly love another being. And that is when I went there for two week um, internship at Madras Crocodile Bank. The first question they asked me over there, what are you afraid of? And me not, uh, I, I did not know what to say. And then I said, okay, I am scared of snakes. I am scared of house geckos. Um, anything other than that, crocodiles are fine because I know they are in the enclosure. So I know they're not gonna do anything to us. The 
after um, the one hour meeting we had with them, they came back and said, great, we have got your research that you will have to, your short research you'll have to do. And I was allotted the Gharials, the study on how they use their bulbous snot that they have and uh, make different calls. This is for the males. And his name was Garfield, an eligible 29 year old bachelor who was uh, available for the research. So it was really very interesting because I thought, okay, they'll give me something like in a lab and you have to do some research. And no, it's nothing of that sort. It was just you observing the crocodile, understanding the nature, understanding its behavior and the kind of behavior it has with different people, the environment. Again, the sense of compassion. Reptiles, as per se, um, uh, this is to everyone, they are familiar with humans. They do not befriend humans. So when you, you should not mistake their familiarity with you. But that familiarity itself has a sense of compassion in it. They would not hurt like how sometimes we have senseless violence uh, among groups. They do not hurt one another. They are more defensive, they're territorial, yes, but they'll only attack when they think they need to. Otherwise, they are very, um, what should I say, accommodative of others. In the same enclosure, we had Travancore tortoises. We had other uh, beings and fishes. He never hurt any of them. And none of them even bothered about each other. This is the coexistence that we require. And the other set of research that they gave me was to do a sex ratio of all the oriental garden lizards they had in the enclosure. That is the, uh, the one kilometer square mile that they had. And it was interesting because they're saying, uh, unless you confront your fear, unless you face your fear, you won't understand the true beauty of what you were scared of. What I mean to say is when you face your fear, you overcome it. And when you overcome it, you overcome a sense of uncertainty. You, uh, you overcome a sense of, what should I say, negative thoughts that are coming to it. You start loving the creature or the being for who they are. You understand the love they have for the nature and the work they have in the world. The Oriental Garden Lizards, you, many of you may not know, but at the roadsides, in the walkways, pathways, there are a lot of these small white eggs. And we mistake them for little stones and pebbles that we just kick aside or something. But did you know that within them, there'll be a cluster of, uh, one nest will have a cluster of at least eight to 10 eggs. And that those are babies in it. And they all have a crucial role. They are pest controllers. Some of them keep the population of insects, everything. The entire world is a web of life and we all are connected. Then started my work with Wildlife SOS and Friendicos where there were, 101 cases, uh, actually there are many more, but 101 cases and stories of rescues, of love, of abandonment that we used to face every day of our work life because we also have a rescue operation. So each day we used to get calls from different people from across India, but especially where I used to operate was in Delhi. And here we had calls for monitor lizards. We had calls for hit and run case of meal guy. We had cases of dogs, cats, donkeys, horses, many of these animals, both domesticated and wild. But we just, what, what I understood from each of these stories is the kind of how we teach children morals, but this is an action by people who are actually going to rescue them. We have a snake. Um, that we had in our um, transect facility. And he never ever hurt any of the other rescued animals because there is a sense of, what should I say, people being there to help them. There was a sense of there's a care and there is no other issue that's gonna happen. Everything is gonna be safe. They felt safe. We felt safe. Must and be. because of the feeling of being safe, there was no one injuring anyone else. We also have monitor lizards. They used to sit on our keyboards because that was uh, like cats. They find it warm place. And then we used to cuddle them and all. There was one who used to feel, oh, I'm a dog, but he was in the body of a um, monitor lizard. But they're very sweet. They'll never harm you. 
these are compassionate acts because they recognize it. We need to recognize it as well. Every day we get calls saying there are monkeys in our balcony, they're stealing our clothes, but do we understand the problems and the issues why they have come there? We have to understand each other's lives. We have to understand each other's issues. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to spend your entire life doing it, but just a second of you thinking, why, why is it happening? And also understanding, can you do something about it? That will help the entire world change. Just, uh, I do not know how many people know, but in towards Chandni Chowk, there is a bird hospital. And now that the season of summer is coming, uh, we'll see a lot of these birds, animals actually dehydrating. And there are a lot of people and bystanders that I see on the roads. Sometimes a kite falls or a bird falls and people do not know what to do. A small act of just providing it shade, giving it water is something that I have seen from homeless people to even my mother giving them and saving them. That small act is a big thing for the entire ecosystem. Each one of us do a small thing and we do not realize it, that it is called compassion. Yes, so now I will move on to what um, the blockages are. There are, according to me, I have taken four of the major blockages towards compassion. And these are blockages that I have understood from my personal uh, experiences. So I hope that these are okay. Um, the first one, and I, I confess that we all as humans, sometimes we fall prey to this emotion called anger. The emotion of anger prevents us from actually being compassionate towards each other. Second is jealousy. Jealousy is something that we want to belittle the other and stand that we are right. We want to put down the other. That is not good according to me because then what happens is you're not being compassionate and that leads to arrogance and arrogance too does not show compassion, not only to others, but to yourself. One thing that we overlook um, while talking to the other is what I call deep listening. Listening to the other is the fourth blockage that I would say is very important. In many of our fights, quarrels with others, or even just chit-chatting with one another. We do not understand through listening what is the underlining factor of why the person is saying what he or she is saying. Only when you understand and listen would that become a path to compassionate coexistence. Based on this, I would again share my screen. And what you see here is a world that we envision to be compassionate. Throughout history, as we go back in time, our cultures in India, within different communities and across the world, a big part of our evolution has been compassion. We say survival of the fittest. But have we ever thought thinking a little differently, that it's not only survival of the fittest, but also how much we're compassionate about each other, about each other's survival, about each other's well-being, that kind of promotes us to being what I call a good human being. When you look at the Jain philosophy, Mahavira, the entire religion is based on compassionate living. When you think of Buddhism, the Dalai Lama speaks about uh, universal responsibility and compassion. Even Sri Aurobindo and the Madra speak about compassion. Compassion to oneself and the others. To quote uh, Sri Aurobindo, he once said, compassion emerges from a sense of oneness when I do not remain separate from you and your condition becomes mine. Similar understanding of compassion has been 
going through each of the religions. It is us to understand if you want to stand divided or at least understand the teachings that each of these religions and cultures are telling us. For example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the, during the lockdown, um, one person called and his organization, Harsh Mandar talks also of compassion for all. Let me ask you one thing, and maybe this is something you can ask within yourself to each one of you, uh, our inner being. How many of us treat the homeless, the more downtrodden as our family, rather than giving them a look of disgust and dirt? How many of us feel for others that they are under stress or un, uh, in a situation that they need help? Have you ever thought that that situation may come back to us or one day uh, strike us when we are not looking? These are some uncertain times and issues that, of course, we do not want to dwell upon, but also we have to keep this thought that sometime it might happen. It's not that you do this, it's not tit for tat. Basically, it's to improve and accept and understand and learn about yourself. There's also a saying that what you do to the least of my people, you do to the least of me. What you want others to do to you, you do to them. These are small acts of kindness and compassion. For example, even helping someone in your schools, if there are any students in the uh, group or even your children, the act of sharing a sharpener, a pencil during someone's need, or even also helping them out, maybe crossing the road or helping them take a bag of goods is a small act of kindness. And more than that, do not forget the three magic words that we keep saying all the time as we grow up. Thank you, please, I'm sorry. These are three words and three acts of kindness and compassion that we have for each other because from these we learn how to become a better human being. Moving to the path towards compassion. What exactly is compassion? How can I as an individual be compassionate to others? There are a few points, at least five points I wanna tell everyone. Everyone's litter is our litter. I hope everyone understands that. Your garbage, your kuda, as we call it, we might put it here and there, but ultimately the planet is our family. We are kind of littering our own house. What is the sense of cleanliness? What is dirt? It's all here. We want to keep our houses clean, but we do not care for the other or their space. Keep in mind that we are again one family. Help the strays. Because I come from, I, I am an animal lover, I need to say this. Help the strays. We want exotic breeds, we want exotic dogs, we want exotic everything in life. Being materialistic is not so good. But just a small act of compassion of just feeding the animal. Yes, of course you have feeding spots over there or keeping water for the animal or the bird or anything, or even providing their temporary shelter is a good act of kindness. You may not know, or many of you do, but for many security guards, they are big best friends in the night. So you still have dogs barking saying, oops, there's someone coming here, please wake up and check. And again, as I've mentioned earlier, adopt not shop. There are many who are looking out for homes and loving families, so please do your need for. Uh, thirdly, when um, give the earth a drink. What it means is you have plants of your own at home. Yes, you have to look after them. That is one act of kindness to your own plants and also to the oxygen that we require on Earth. But also that we need to be a little more caring towards others' plants and also on the roadside that we see. Do your little needful. Do not waste that little water that is there on your water bottles and throw it away. Someone really might need it at that time. Fourth, don't squish the spider. 
we have a tendency as we grow up, uh, I do not know how many adults do it, but we have a tendency to break the whip. We have a tendency to block the path of the ants. We have a tendency to sometimes um, end the life of a smaller, weaker being. Please do not do that. They are doing what they do because of a reason, because their role on the planet. And only when it works, can we be a little more kind to others and also promote as life goes on. And last, drive with care. Many of us know how to drive, yes, and many of us do sit in the cars uh, and uh, have mobility, but there are a lot of animals who do not know and understand what a zebra crossing is. So we have to be a little mindful as to saying that there are quite a few animals who require attention and space as they are there. As I almost end the session, I have a last thing to say. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be brilliant. You don't have to dedicate every minute of your life to helping someone or be it a human being or any other species. What you need to do is keep your eyes and ears open and you'll be surprised to see how many people and how many creatures are out there who do compassionate acts each moment of their lives but we need to recognize them and through this you my friends will better understand yourselves this is what i truly believe in and once we imbibe you don't have to imbibe all of them all these points that i've said but if you start acting and practicing compassion through small acts of favor and do better to both yourself and others you'll become a better human being and you'll accept yourself a little more. So enjoy this moment of your life and look forward to be having a better place to live in. So thank you so much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the short um, uh, talk I had. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Um, does anyone have questions? Uh, if you could please raise your hand. Arunima, I think uh, that's all from my end. And if anyone has something, I would uh, maybe they'll let I us know. I think, uh, yeah, thank you so much, Aprajita. Uh, there are some uh, responses during the uh, talk, yes. in the yeah. chat box. So even I was going through that. If we have any question, we can pick that up. Yeah. I think during the session, Shanta had raised her hand. Maybe we can uh, yes. ask her if she wanted to say something. Is Shanta still there? Thank you, sir. Yes, I think she's there. Vijlani, sir, if you have anything, if you would like to share. Let's first give the chance to other yeah. participants. Uh, is Shanta coming? A second, she's still there and uh, she's not on mute. So please go ahead if you have anything to say. Anyone else? I, I'd seen some question in the chat about uh, mosquitoes. Yeah, I was reading them. Hmm. So we'd like to take that up. Um, maybe I just give me a moment, please. I'll just read it. Mm -hmm. 
or if uh, shruti uh, if you are there would you like to Um, uh, Mr. Arun, just one minute. I'll just uh, reply to what I've read um, by Shruti Azad. Um, thank you so much for sharing, uh, Shruti. Uh, yes, there is. Uh, we all do have a tendency to get irritated. Um, and yeah, uh, sometimes health also is important. And we sometimes get um, a little stressed when we hear the cases of um, dengue, chikungunya, others. And yes, sometimes we do take upon act of self-defense. I would say it's self-defense when you clap and sometimes um, uh, kill the mosquito. And we we are sometimes irritated. Even I get irritated with mosquitoes. And I understand we need to find the fine balance between irritation and also acceptance to letting the mosquito live. But I would say it it depends person to person how compassionate each person is, who you're compassionate towards. You can bloom towards that. You do not have to be compassionate to everyone and everything. That That is not possible. Um, but do try your best. That is one thing I can um, suggest. Mr. Arun? Hello, uh, Amita. Actually, I want to ask one question. Uh, can I speak in Hindi? Okay. And then what is the difference with, between this dayaluta and oneness? Dayaluta and kindness, like you in your uh, whole uh, presentation, you uh, inform us that we should have kind for the uh, wildlife and others. So I want to know this, what is the difference between oneness and dialuta? Kindness. Yeah. So um, uh, Mr. Arun, is it okay if I say Hindi and English? Dono milake bol tu? Ah, yes, yes. I'm not very good at Hindi. That's my issue. Okay, okay. Yeah, you, uh, you so can. the thing is, kindness is an act of when you feel sensitivity, pity. And also if you want to have, what should I say, to do better, to do good for the person or any other being. I, I, that is what I feel the kindness is. Um, when you're being a little more sympathetic. Oneness, on the other hand, is when you, it's more like empathy, but it's not exactly empathy. When you feel for the person by being in their shoes, by understanding that it's, um, uh, when you're um, feeling, when you're feeling, um, what should I say? Not sympathetic only, but when you're understanding the pain that they go through, they are one family. You feel that you are them and they are you. Whereas act of kindness could separate you from your being. So that is what my answer to you would be, Mr. Arun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe you can say something about oneness. Yes. Uh, thank you, Amita. <laughs> uh, compassion is an attitude. And uh, to some it may come naturally. Uh, they are born with it, sort of. They can't be otherwise. But then to many, it may be rooted in uh, a certain rationale, uh, in certain way of thinking. And uh, they might have to train themselves to be more compassionate. Now we have a wide spectrum, you know, of consciousness, and uh, depending on that, and also some of us tend to be more emotional and some more mental. So, uh, depending upon that, but all the same, there's no denying that um, uh, compassion is uh, an attitude that is rooted in oneness. And uh, as Arun was saying, that what's the difference between the two? The oneness is the proper basis of uh, compassion. And uh, uh, Sri has uh, talked quite a bit about it. Um, uh, sort of being a part of the evolutionary ladder. 
because if the lower scales of evolution, yes, uh, preservation of self was most important. Uh, but as evolution proceeded, uh, while that continued to be important and that, that continues to be important even in human beings, uh, gradually there has been more and more of a tendency to have a give and take. And uh, instead of just the survival of the fittest, it has been more of coexistence rather than uh, the fittest weeding everybody out. That is not what has been the trend in evolution. And if one was to think on terms of the evolution as it will take place in future, uh, we can only move from uh, the present average level of human consciousness towards uh, something which is uh, still more rooted in oneness and uh, yet compatible with survival. So uh, both these things can go together. They're not mutually exclusive. That is preservation of the self and uh, also coexist coexisting uh, with a sense of compassion with others. So the two can coexist and uh, youngsters like Aparajata, uh, they give a ray of hope that yes, the world is moving in that direction. And uh, she has talked on the basis of uh, her own experience. And we can see that uh, uh, her experience has been on the whole uh, very pleasant. And uh, you can make out from her face the way she describes her experiences that uh, she has done it out of a sense of compassion, but then uh, it has not been just a duty to be done. She has enjoyed it. She has experienced joy. She has got a sense of fulfillment from it. And uh, that is what uh, is important because although that may not have been the purpose of doing it, but all the same, who doesn't enjoy getting that type of a sense of fulfillment from what one is doing? On the other hand, the negative sort of emotions, which she called blockages, they are rooted in a sort of ignorance, ignorance of the deepest truths of existence, because it is that which uh, makes us concentrate exclusively on ourselves and uh, not look beyond our little self. Uh, that ends up uh, uh, sort of manifests in different ways, be it anger, be it jealousy or uh, lack of compassion. All these are rooted in the same thing. And uh, while I mean that may seem uh, natural to some, uh, one realizes that uh, they're not the happiest of people. So uh, it doesn't bring uh, the type of joy and uh, the sense of uh, fulfillment that Aparajita was reflecting in uh, the way she was describing her experiences. Uh, however, having said that, uh, uh, preservation of self also continues to be important. That is where uh, creatures like mosquitoes and all come in. Once I asked this, put this question about what we should do with mosquitoes uh, to a very senior and uh, sincere sadhak. And uh, what he said was that uh, when it comes to creatures, tiny creatures like that who might uh, harm us, first, of course, we should try and keep them out in the sense that they can coexist outside your homes. So have sort of uh, uh, windows which have uh, those nets, you know, so that. Uh, you can keep them out. So first thing is to try and not keep, uh, keep let them in. Uh, do not let stagnant water accumulate where they can grow in the house. So those are, uh, prevention is better than trying to kill them. And one can by and large do that. But then having said that, he said that, that the mosquito is at a level of consciousness where uh, it's very unlikely that it would feel any pain. And therefore, if it is done suddenly, uh, then uh, probably we are not really uh, causing any, inflicting any pain on the creature. Uh, the urge to live in uh, creatures at that level is just uh, a sort of a reflex urge. They have a capacity to uh, live and on superimposed on that is uh, just a sort of a primitive ref uh, urge to live at the reflex level. It's only when we go to higher animals like reptiles, etc., that uh, the emotions really start manifesting. And this has a relationship to the type of brains that all these creatures have. At the lower level, you just have a little enlargement at the head end, which we call the sort of a ganglion or something. That doesn't have enough space to really uh, be able to ex uh, experience emotions. It's only at the reptilian brain that you start getting very prominently that part of the brain, uh, which is able to channelize the emotions. And that evolution has been with a purpose because when you couple the basic needs with emotions, it makes the survival of the animal easier. So it's in a further improvement. In addition to the capacity to la uh, live, the animal also 
has uh, an emotional involvement in living. So it's not just the capacity, but a strong urge linked to emotions. So for example, when the animal doesn't find food, it is miserable. When it gets food, it is happy. So in anticipation of uh, the happiness that it will get when it finds food and to escape the misery of hunger, it is motivated to look for food. So that helps the survival of the animal. So that is why that linkage is there. And that from that, it also follows since these creatures can experience uh, joy and sorrow, they have a greater need for the type of love and compassion that Aparajita was talking about than say mosquitoes or spiders. Because you know you can give what you have to those who need it. We may have the compassion, but then we can give it to those who need it. Probably mosquitoes and spiders don't need it to the extent that uh, reptiles and mammals do. Thank you so much, Bijlani, sir. Um, just to add to Shankar Dutta, uh, sir's um, uh, chat, um, it's similar to, it's uh, same as what Dr. Bijlani, sir, also just said right now, you may not want to let them in, um, especially in the ecosystem you're living in. Yes, pigeons are uh, becoming a menace um, these days, and there's a lot of scientific research as to why they are becoming um, a lot of other species of birds are also flooding and moving out from urban uh, areas to the rural areas. And pigeons have taken over and they're getting um, they're getting food wherever they go. A lot of other issues are also related to this. The, this is a very big topic uh, we can uh, maybe discuss some other time. But uh, as you were talking about invasion of the space, um, there are ways and humane methods through which uh, you may want to protect your space um, than having um, these birds come and also invade your space. Because yes, I understand they have a lot of other issues. For example, they leave a lot of remnants after their nesting and also of themselves. And it is a pain also for the human being to keep cleaning after them each day. So there are do take up a few of these human methodologies of keeping them away rather than uh, um, hurting them. Uh, but yes, there are a lot of things available in the market. So do let me know if you require any because I can give you tips on that as well. Thank you. Um, what uh, Amita Ma'am has written, yes, uh, there are very few of us who actually do visit uh, hospitals and animal shelters. Those living in Delhi itself, there are over 12 animal shelters that are open and uh, people can visit over there. You can uh, see them. And also the bird hospital in Chandni Chowk is not open for visitors. But the kind of stories and the kind of uh, the amount of patients that come in and you you would be surprised that over 200 patients go there every day um, from kabi kaba wo, jo manja hota that we fly kites, sometimes they get hurt from there. There are many cases. So do visit them, do um, uh, show your support to them, but also rather than doing any of that, maybe just help wherever you see a person in need. Yes. Anything else? Aprajita, there are uh, some very lovely responses for the talk. And yeah. one question also uh, I see, which even I faced personally. So I would like to mention that. So yes. um, Ravi Chandran Venkatesh uh, mm -hmm. has asked how to handle fellow human beings who object to feeding birds on the terrace. So even even I faced it. The society people they say that uh, it it's not clean. And any response on that? Okay, so I'm understanding that you want to feed birds, but uh, the society is against it. Is that right? Yeah. Even I understand yeah. that. Also. Yeah. So uh, it's it's something that we followed while I was working in Wildlife SOS that uh, you need to make feeding points in your society. You cannot feed them everywhere and wherever you feel like, but also say you need to also condition them saying that this is the area, this is the feeding ground, this is what we give. Um, but that also comes with its own share of issues. For example, the kind of grains or what you feed also 
tells you what species would come to feed over them. Secondly, there is also an environmental factor that when you feed birds, you're taking away the ability to explore and flight. The entire thing about why birds have wings was because they need to fly and have the technology to search for food. So when you're not able to search for food, and for example, if you have these pop-ups, I call them the pop-up stores for grains, you do not use that much of energy. To Sorry, on the uh, circuit. Yeah, thank you. Um, you do not use that much energy. So that is why these days, if you see the birds, they're a little overweight. Um, that is causing a lot of issues uh, to their health, but also to their beaks. So these birds, uh, when they uh, forage for food, there's a particular type of food that they look for. We need to understand what food do they need to, what is the dietary condition, what do they eat, then only provide that. We can't give them any waste or anything extra we have in the kitchen. Because the many of the cases that we had when we uh, rescued them, their beaks, as you see, when you see the structure of the beak, it is cracked, it is bent, and this is all because when you put it on that ground, sometimes you have concrete, you have cement, you have brick, you have glass floor, different types of floor. The flooring itself affects the bird. So there are a lot of uh, scientific um, reasons why people sometimes say you should not feed maybe in a particular place or the particular thing. But if you feel you want to feed, because we still want to have an ecosystem of birds that are suddenly vanishing, you can do that. But I would suggest if you would just research a little more into what exactly would you like to feed. And also if the community can come together and have a spot um, where you want to do that. Um, it also generates a lot of issues of felines. Um, cats, stray cats start um, um, uh, targeting that space as well. So there are a lot of considerations when you are wanting to have such a space. <laughs> yeah, I've just read the message. Yes, they do love, um, like how we like junk food. Um, they also do love rice. Um, but what happens is that we can't just give them like that one um, type of grain. There are many types of other grains and other dals and green leafy vegetables, fruits that they enjoy. Uh, but we try to make that show that we have to make sure that we give them more indigenous, more native um, food and uh, uh, ingredients than something from outside. And uh, I, I, I'm a person who would say do not have too many feeding grounds because uh, the, the issue of pigeons are already a uh, little more over the limit. So we might have to see for other birds how you would like to cater to them. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else uh, having any question, please raise the hand or put in the chat box. We have one question. Yes. Um, so the idea of how to handle stray dogs. Um, the thing is, uh, one must understand uh, that dogs are a pack. They're territorial, similar to the racist macaques, how we, re we all called the red bum monkeys. All of these, the issue is you can't take them away from a territory because as soon as you do that, there'll be a new pack that comes over. And this is a repeated case. It's a circular case that keeps repeating. We cannot get rid of them. What you can do is actually, as many of these organizations do mention, is what your act of, I would say, compassion or kindness um, is that if the community can appoint few members of the society who would actually look after first the health. So maybe routine checkups or even getting them vaccinated. The first thing you have to do towards stray dogs is to get them vaccinated. Second is to have, um, again, as mentioned earlier, a feeding point where the animal lovers can actually feed them. The reason when I promote feeding these strays is because when they befriend the community, they keep the community safe. 
and they also behave like guards and also good companions to dogs. The only issue is that there are times when you feel that they need training or something. There are a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, I do not know about Pune, but Mumbai has uh, other organization called Doggiversity where you get trainings as to how you look after both your pets and the strays. So there are many organizations that are doing that. So maybe if someone wants to get in touch with them and ask them maybe how, how can someone suggest us how they can help the community. So there are many things they can do. And yes, as mentioned by Amitaji, that neutering and uh, spaying is something that most of the municipal corporations are doing across the country, and that will help. But um, my suggestion is uh, do not um, cull them, do not remove them from the space because that territory in, what should I say, the animal kingdom is an available space. It may be a little different from what we perceive as space and protection, but for such animals and such species, it is a space of encroachment. If you give them a new space, they will come. It happens in our own uh, residential area. We had few dogs and recently we have none. Uh, we do not know if someone took them or what happened, but what I have noticed is in the last two weeks, now we have two new ones. So what do you do of it? We can't just remove them because it will again take place. So we have to find these little areas where we can mutually understand the species. But also, yes, you have to take care of your children's health and also safety. Do not let your children throw stones or hurt the animal because these animals remember like us and they might uh, come back a little more violent. So you, you might want to be a little more careful about it. Yep. I think uh, that was the last one, I don't remember. I think so. Rajita, do you want to briefly say about Penny? Uh, uh, one minute about your stray Penny. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> apologize for that. Um, the thing is that for me, the COVID year I thought was going to be a little gloomy. Uh, that year I did take up another second master's for myself to keep myself busy and also to get more skills. But what made that year vibrant was the little girl Penny. Penny is um, the cat, one stray cat who, again, as usual, accidentally came into our house. And uh, me being um, an animal lover, I started feeding. My parents started feeding. And then the whole question, who's going to look after it? We're going to travel. We're going to do this, that, everything. I'm like, oh, it's fine. It's only locked down where we can't go. And being privileged compared to the others, um, I felt, yes, we can, we can look after her. Little did we know that in few weeks, she would be pregnant and uh, be, uh, becoming a new mom is not easy, especially for a very um, young kitten cat, I would say. And she did not know how to be a cat. For everything, she'll look at me during the feeding time and say, is this something edible? So I had to show her this is something to eat. This is how you do uh, potty training, cleaning. This is what you do. She did not know. And she gave birth to four beautiful kittens. Um, she were, The kittens were on the slide if and someone uh, uh, noticed that. And um, unfortunately, we lost one, uh, but three of them survived. And she later on went and injured her front paw. Uh, there was a big glass. And because she, being a stray cat, she wants to move around. And she went into a construction site. And then we had to give her away to a sanctuary because they had to remove, uh, she could not walk, she could not do anything and because we keep traveling. So right now she is at the sanctuary and all her three kittens thankfully have got adopted to beautiful families. And we still, I, it's my dream again this year, I have to go and visit her. And the person I'm in touch with says that, yep, yeah, she's still there. So I'm waiting to go there, but she changed my life. And I think I've, I, I've become a little more considerate um, I feel that I've become a little more considerate, understanding others' needs. I did not know what a young mom requires. How is it? How difficult is it for a single person to look after children? A lot of things about introspecting about your own life, reflecting about yourself, about others. These are some things that she taught me to do. And though our time was short, uh, especially in cat years, um, 
I feel that all of them, each one of them that I've mentioned and others who have not, have actually contributed to be like letting me be who I am today. So I really have this thank you for this opportunity to all who have mentioned who are there, who are not no longer there. And also all of you to have given me the platform and also had the patience to listen to me. And that is a, a step towards compassion because uh, many of you may not know, but this is my first virtual talk and this was a really good platform. So thank you so much. Thank you, Parajita. We hope to have you again. So your first, but I'm sure it's not going to be the last one. Just the beginning. Uh, I don't know if there's nothing else that anyone has to say. Then uh, sure. maybe we can uh, wind up the session. Everyone has uh, lovely responses from the talk. And uh, no more questions, I think. Yes, uh, so there's a question regarding the recording. So we'll upload that on the YouTube channel, Yoga Education Spirituality. Yes, Spirituality on YouTube. Thank you so much, Aparadita. It was really an enlightening session and inspiring, of course. And uh, still many responses. So no more questions, I guess. So we can, of course, close today's session. Thank you. Raj, sorry, Arunima, you yeah. can type the name of the YouTube channel maybe on the chat. Oh, sure. You can see the channel is Yes Spirituality. It's a single word. The S serves for both Yes and Spirituality. Thank you all for joining today. And uh, we hope to see you all again. And uh, we have the Yes Talks every Saturday at 6 p.m. Uh, different topics, different speakers. So I hope you all join there as well. We can close today's session with a moment of peaceful silence. I think next week is uh, a talk on discovering your passion. Isn't it? Discovering no. uh, exam stress, I guess. Yeah, next week is exam stress by uh, Sri Vidya. Yeah. Sri Vidya, who has uh, spoken earlier also. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you.